Dred Scott against Sanford, 1857. These are the facts. In the 19th century, there were many Americans who viewed slaves in the same way as we today view cars. Some are easy to manage, others are born troublemakers. Some inspire love and admiration, others are downright hateful. But they were all primarily property. While this view does not justify the following decision, it will make it a little more understandable. In 1832, John Emerson, an army doctor, bought a husky, healthy, young Negro slave called Sam. The doctor was stationed in Illinois and lived there with Sam until 1836, when he was transferred to Fort Snelling in the part of the Louisiana Territory where slavery had been outlawed by the Missouri Compromise. It was there that Sam, whose first wife had been sold away from him, met Harriet, a slave owned by Fort Snelling's Indian agent. Dr. Emerson bought the slave girl, Harriet, for Sam, who married her with his master's permission. A few years later, Emerson and his slave couple took a steamboat down the Mississippi bound for St. Louis. While still north of the northern boundary of Missouri, Harriet gave birth to a daughter. At an unknown point during these wanderings, Sam picked up the name by which he was to become so famous, Dred Scott. Dr. Emerson died in St. Louis, and with the rest of his property, the three slaves were willed to his widow. Dred Scott, however, contended that he was no longer legally a slave, and he sued for his and his family's freedom. The Missouri Supreme Court, however, ruled that although Scott might technically have been free while in Illinois, when he returned to Missouri, he returned to slavery, and he was therefore still the property of Mrs. Emerson. Dred Scott continued to fight for his freedom, and finally, in 1855, nine years after Scott had begun his struggle, the Supreme Court agreed to hear his case. The argument of the attorneys for Dred Scott. May it please the court. Dred Scott lived for more than two years with Dr. Emerson in Illinois, a state where slavery is prohibited. A master who takes his slave to reside in a state where slavery is forbidden emancipates the slave. Scott's daughter, Eliza, being born north of the Missouri border, was born a free Negro. Thus, both Dred and Eliza are and should be set free. Harriet's freedom depends on the validity of the Missouri Compromise. If it is a valid law, then she too lived with her masters in an area where slavery is not allowed and is free for the same reasons as her husband. The United States Constitution gives Congress the power to make laws for territories. Where, we ask, is it written in the Constitution that Congress cannot pass a law prohibiting slaveholding in the territories? Our opponents argue that the Missouri Compromise is unconstitutional because under it, property, as defined by the states, in the form of slaves, cannot be held in the territories. This argument, however, would leave the United States Congress to the demands of the legislatures of the states. If those legislatures declared that slaves were no longer property, the compromise would suddenly become constitutional. And if thereafter they should reverse themselves and slaves were to become property, the compromise would again become unconstitutional. Harriet is free. If then Scott and his family are free Negroes, the only question is, is Dred Scott a citizen with the right to sue in the courts of the United States? The argument that free Negroes are not citizens assumes that Congress may naturalize white people only. But this is not so. Naturalization has been granted repeatedly by treaty and by act of Congress to Indians and Negroes. Free Negroes can, as other citizens can, hold property and carry on business. That they cannot vote does not mean they're not citizens. No one denies citizenship to white women who also cannot vote. The Constitution of the United States recognizes but two kinds of free persons, citizens and aliens. 
Nobody supposes that free Negroes are aliens. They must therefore be citizens. The argument of the attorneys for Sanford. May it please the court. All persons, your honors, born in the United States are not citizens. Examples are children of foreign ambassadors, Indians, and colored persons. Since Negroes cannot be citizens by birth, the only way they may become citizens is by becoming naturalized but our Constitution gives the power of naturalization to Congress exclusively. A master may, if he wishes, free his slave. But mere discharge from bondage does not make the slave into a citizen. Only Congress can do that, and it has not yet done it. Under the present laws of our land, free blacks are not citizens and cannot bring lawsuits in our courts. Dred Scott, however, is not only not a citizen, he is not even free. Neither the Illinois Constitution nor the Missouri Compromise automatically emancipate a slave journeying with his master through a free state or territory. When slaves, as Dred Scott did, return with their master to a state allowing slavery, they give up any claim to freedom they might have had in the free territory. Both Dredd and Harriet are still slaves, and the property of Sanford. Their daughter Eliza's claim to freedom is based on the validity of the Missouri Compromise. But the Constitution limits Congress's power to making needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. Forbidding slavery regulates not property belonging to the United States, but property belonging to individual slaveholders. The Constitution does not permit Congress to pass a law which practically keeps out of a new territory the people of certain states in the Union, a law which keeps them from taking with them and holding their slaves a form of property recognized by the Constitution. Such a law is unconstitutional. Such a law is the Missouri Compromise. The Opinion of the Court by Chief Justice Taney. When a plaintiff sues in a court of the United States, it is necessary that he should show that he is entitled to sue there. It becomes, therefore, our duty to decide whether the plaintiff, Dred Scott, is or is not entitled to sue as a citizen of the United States. The words people of the United States and citizens mean the same thing. The question before us is whether the Negroes are part of this people. We think they are not, and that they were not intended to be included under the word citizen in the Constitution. It is not the province of the court to decide upon the justice or injustice, the policy or impolicy of these laws. The duty of the court is to interpret the Constitution according to its true intent and meaning when it was adopted. Neither the class of persons who had been imported as slaves, nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as a part of the people, nor intended to be included in the general words used in that memorable instrument. The Negroes had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race. The Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his own benefit. Accordingly, a Negro of the African race was regarded as an article of property and held and bought and sold as such in every one of the 13 colonies. It is very true that in the northern colonies measures had been taken for the abolition of slavery, but this change had not been produced by any change of opinion in relation to this race. But because it was discovered from experience that slave labor was unsuited to the climate and productions of these states, for some of these states were actively engaged in the slave trade, 
and this traffic was openly carried on, and fortunes were accumulated by it without reproach. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution show that a perpetual and impassable barrier was intended to be erected between the white race and the one which they had reduced to slavery. And no distinction in this respect was made between the free Negro and the slave. But this stigma of the deepest degradation was fixed upon the whole race. Upon a full and careful consideration of the subject, the court is of the opinion that Dred Scott was not a citizen of Missouri within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States and not entitled as such to sue in its courts. We proceed to inquire whether the facts relied on by the plaintiff entitled him to his freedom. The difficulty which meets us is whether Congress was authorized to pass the Missouri Compromise under any of the powers granted to it by the Constitution. For if the authority is not given by that instrument, it is the duty of this court to declare it void and inoperative. No one, we presume, will contend that Congress can make any law in a territory respecting the establishment of religion or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. These powers and others, in relation to rights of person, are in express and positive terms denied to the general government. And the rights of private property have been guarded with equal care. It seems, however, to be supposed that there is a difference between property in a slave and other property, and that different rules may be applied. The Constitution, however, recognizes the right of property of the master in a slave. No word can be found in the Constitution which gives Congress a greater power over slave property or which entitles property of that kind to less protection than property of any other description. The Missouri Compromise, which prohibited a citizen from holding property in a territory of the United States, is unconstitutional and void, and neither Dred Scott himself nor any of his family were made free by being carried into the Upper Louisiana Territory. Upon the whole, therefore, it is the judgment of this court that Dred Scott is not a citizen of Missouri in the sense in which that word is used in the Constitution. The suit is dismissed for want of jurisdiction.